Hi there, everyone. Christy here. I'm doing this from the road, so the audio might be a little crazy and there might be some annoying background sounds for which I apologize, but it's been a long time since I've done original content here on my channel and I'm really itching to do some. I recently picked up an interesting book. It was so interesting that I decided to make a video covering the topics that the authors cover in their prologue because I think it gives a far more accurate view of the state of modern feminism more accurate than what you're going to get from watching anti-feminists on YouTube. And so to that end, I'm going to be picking out sections from a book called Reclaiming the F-Word, Feminism Today. It's written by Catherine Redfern and Kristen Oon, A-U-N-E, and so I don't know the correct pronunciation on that. That was a guess. And this is their new edition. It's a second edition of a book that they published a few years ago. I'm going to be skipping the acknowledgements, but I will cover the prologue and then the introduction to the second edition, because both sections make contributions that I think are important to understanding what comes next in terms of the chapters of the book. And once again, I'm going to be dipping in and out of certain sections. What I will do is I'll indicate the page number of where I'm reading from in the bottom corner of the video so that if you want to make reference to the hard copy edition, you can certainly do so. So jumping right into the prologue. In the second paragraph, they start, I'm just going to start in the middle with something that I think is, is relevant. So article after article proclaimed that feminism was dead and stated that young people in particular are uninterested in this once vital movement. We received emails telling us, hilariously, that all you feminists do is sit and slag off good entertainment and cry about how gingerbread men should be called gingerbread people. This simply didn't tally with what we had seen through our research and involvement with the feminist community. We will explain why feminism is still vitally important and introduce some of today's inspiring new feminists. We want to show feminism is liberating, diverse, challenging, exciting, relevant, and inclusive, and we hope to offer inspiration for further involvement. We surveyed as many self-identified feminists in the UK as we could. Nearly 1,300 feminists replied from across Britain, aged from 15 to 81. We believe it is the largest survey of feminists that has been undertaken in recent years. Whilst all surveys have their limitations, we now have evidence of what a large group of UK feminists think and want. And guess what? Gingerbread men weren't mentioned once. They go on to write, We hope to prove that there is a large group of feminists reclaiming the F-word from those who would trash it. It's optimistic, rolling your sleeves up and getting things done feminism. In the preface of their new edition, I think they do a, a really fantastic job of doing a global survey Again, I'm not reading every single line of the book for copyright purposes. I am dipping in and out. And so if you find this information intriguing, you should definitely go check out the book itself. This section of the prologue is called Feminism Today. Four years ago, we wanted to shed light on the state of the feminist movement. Our book was unapologetically positive. Feminism today is diverse and vibrant, we argued, with something for everyone to get passionate about and a smorgasbord of opportunities for activism. This book's core argument, that there are serious gender inequalities in the world today and feminists are acting to challenge them, remains true. While some of the statistics cited for individual countries may have changed slightly, they remain broadly accurate. We won't rehearse the evidence and arguments here. Instead, we'll focus on the changes that have occurred in the social context in which feminism takes place in society and how some feminists have been engaging and with what issues and effects. The next section is entitled Feminism Back in the Spotlight. And again, I'll be skipping a little bit, um, getting right to the things that I think are interesting um, and that I can pull out in short bits for this video. Media scholar Caitlin Mendes, in her study of over 1,100 news articles in British and American newspapers, notices a growing press interest in feminism. Yet in the articles she studied, discussions of feminism were often either defensive designed to rescue feminists from negative stereotypes, or show a noticeable shift toward the lifestyling of feminism, more focused on, say, whether Botox or baking can be feminist activity than on the large-scale social or structural issues, such as the economy, or reporting on collective feminist activism. Indeed, we were regularly asked, can you be a stay-at-home mom, watch porn, wear heels, 
use lipstick, and be a feminist. This defensiveness, boiling down to, don't worry, you can be a feminist and still be sexy, in itself proves feminism is still needed. Having to shout, I'm a sexy feminist, surely shows how pressurized our society makes women feel to fulfill a sexy, to some archetypal heterosexual male, feminine ideal. Debates like this show that the struggle is no longer to prove that feminism exists. It is now about what feminism means and requires of us. The next excerpt comes from the section entitled, So What is Feminism Today? While there are no governing committees deciding who is allowed to call themselves feminists, is it really the case that even someone whose views and actions are likely to harm the cause of women's rights can call themselves a feminist? The next section talks about reproductive rights, and as they write, reproductive rights need defending as never before. But the fight for our bodies is not just about abortion. Women in Israel, Uzbekistan, and South Africa have been forcibly sterilized or given contraceptive injections without their consent. Transsexual men and women are also required to be sterilized in many countries in order to be legally recognized as their preferred gender identity. The next section discusses choice and equality in the age of austerity. Feminism, of course, is about more than just reproductive rights, and it has to be about more than just personal choice. After all, our choices can never be completely freely made. Every decision we make is bound up in a whole package of social, cultural, and historical expectations and legacies. And many of these choices are related to capitalism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and the state. The concept of choice must be critiqued so that we can understand and challenge our own disadvantaged positions in a social system which is still structured by patriarchy and capitalism. They then go on to note that the financial crisis itself is gendered. And this is a longer section, so I'm going to skip down to one particular example that they cite. With disability benefits slashed, disabled people's dependency on carers increases, and these duties fall disproportionately to family members. As disability rights activist Emma Round points out, the family members burdened with additional caring responsibilities are mostly women, who at the most receive no more than a meager carer's allowance, amounting to less than a quarter of a weekly minimum wage. Austerity measures reflect a government's preference for shrinking the state and expanding the private and voluntary sectors. This restructuring feminist fear is ideological. It takes us back towards assuming a male breadwinner and female unpaid homemaker, increasing women's financial dependence on male partners and expecting women to take up the slack after public services like child care centers or day centers for aging or disabled relatives have been removed. The changes brought about by government since 2010 have hit women so forcefully that demands for equal pay for men and women seem almost minor in concern. Equality in poverty is no equality at all. They then go on to talk about feminism and left-wing politics. Class-based or anti-capitalist arguments need a feminist perspective and vice versa, but feminism's relationship to the left wing has been strained over the last few years, mainly over approaches to sexual violence. The gang rape of a student on a New Delhi bus provoked an international outcry at India's police, legislation, and public attitudes for not taking sexual violence seriously. The case of gang rape of children in Rochdale, England, and the failure of public services and police to prevent these crimes, shock, anger, and disbelief have prompted anguished reflections on how these terrible events could have happened. Unfortunately for feminists familiar with the scale of sexual violence, these revelations did not come as a surprise. Reports show that in 2009 to 2012, an average of 85,000 women and 12,000 men annually reported being victims of rape or sexual assault by penetration in the UK. Only 15% reported this to the police, and with only around 1,000 convictions. And yet we've heard of powerful people, mainly bungling politicians, excusing rape or downplaying its seriousness, referring variously to legitimate rape, grey rape, and rape rape. Prominent men's support of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange over the alleged rape of two women in Sweden, and his refusal to be extradited for trial caused anger among many. 
Many women have experienced sexism and racism in the Occupy movement, from being propositioned at protest sites and objectified in the Hot Chicks at Occupy Wall Street video, to being expected to take on the -the behind-the-scenes tasks while white men put themselves forward as the voice of the movement. The Socialist Worker Party, part of the UK's radical left movement, also faced charges of sexism. When a female party member accused a prominent committee member of rape, the party did not encourage her to report it to the police. Instead, party members who were friends with the accused conducted an internal investigation and then exonerated the accused. Concerns about the failure of some left-wing groups to take sexual violence seriously are not simply about the handling of a few distinct cases. Rather, they are symptomatic of a wider societal failure to challenge sexism and to create leadership structures that are truly democratic and gender-inclusive. The next section is entitled Feminism, Politics, and Religion. How did the 2011 Arab Spring uprisings across Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Bahrain, Syria, and Yemen affect women? Women joined men in initiating the protests and in some countries were able to join the men on the streets. Yet it quickly emerged that women were not safe within these spaces. Like male protesters, they faced arrest, torture, and death at the hands of military forces. But unlike them, they faced the further violence of rape, virginity tests, and abduction. The connection between religion, politics, and patriarchy were made visible by the trial and jailing of members of Pussy Riot for hooliganism motivated by religious hatred after they performed a punk prayer in a Moscow cathedral. The protest has been interpreted in different ways, as feminist challenge to a patriarchal state, as a protest against the Orthodox Church and its support for Putin, as anti-capitalist, and is anarchist critique of state authoritarianism. Feminist groups in the former Soviet Union have also made the headlines. Ukrainian group Femen, whose topless protests highlighting their concerns towards sex tourism and the lack of abortion rights, have brought them publicity and regular arrests in the Ukraine, were menaced and driven into the woods in nearby Belarus by the KGB when they mocked its president. In 2012, Femen joined forces with Egyptian blogger Aliyah Emadi in a naked protest against Egypt's planned constitution, with, quote, Sharia is not a constitution, unquote, scrawled across her body, El Made stood alongside activists holding the slogans, religion is slavery, and no religion. The increasing visibility of both religious and atheist feminism is also noteworthy. The campaign for women bishops, lost by a surprisingly small margin, saw egalitarians inside the Anglican Church mobilized to argue the theological case for women in senior leadership. The next section is entitled Sexism and Social Media, and the excerpts that I'm going to read from it start with. A 2010 YouGov poll showed that one in three 16- to 18-year-old UK girls have experienced unwanted sexual touching at school. The End Violence Against Women Coalition's new Schools Safe for Girls campaign aims to make sex and relationship education a statutory part of the curriculum and educate young people to understand that violence in relationships is not acceptable. On the positive side, a massive variety of feminist campaigners can be found causing ructions on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, online petition websites, and other forums. The Everyday Sexism Project, too, won a claim for documenting women's everyday experiences, from harassment in the street or the workplace to sexism in adverts, the media, or conversations. With almost 50,000 followers on Twitter and hundreds of daily posts, the project regularly receives comments from men who say it has opened their eyes to the sexism women suffer. The next section is entitled Feminism Now, Action, Controversies, and Disagreements. So this section I'm going to pull out talks about some of the activism that feminists are doing. In response to 40 Days of Life, anti-choice protests outside some abortion clinics, feminists countered with 40 Days of Treats, in which staffs at the targeted clinics were sent supportive gifts and messages. In response to comments about women dressing like sluts from a Canadian police officer, the infamous slut walks spread like wildfire across the world, capturing the imagination of women who'd had enough of being told that what they wore could prevent or cause rape. In the UK, the marches were attended by both men and women, and were for many people their first mixed-sex feminist protest. 
Clearly, the old protest slogan, whatever we wear, wherever we go, yes means yes and no means no, is in no danger of retirement. Campaigns for same-sex marriage continue, yet in many countries, such as Uganda, which recently threatened to introduce a law that could carry the death penalty for being gay, LGBTQI people are still struggling simply to exist. There is still a disagreement about the best way to create a feminist world. Many feminists are worried that popular feminism has sold out to capitalism, heterosexuality, and whiteness. Several high-profile feminists have been criticized for using discriminatory language about disabled or transgendered people, or for seeming to downplay the importance of racism and class issues. In recent years, the term intersectionality has gained prominence within feminist communities. Intersectionality in this context means the oppression and equalities intersect, that it's impossible to understand gender without reference to differences of and relationships between age, sexuality, class, religion, ethnicity, disability, or location. Quote, my feminism will be intersectional or it will be bullshit, unquote, a declaration coined by Flavia Zodan in a post critiquing the feminist community's response to a racist sign held at a slutwalk march, is frequently quoted, and there have been conscious struggles to be more attentive of intersectionality in some feminist conferences. Black Feminist Manchester reports a resurgence of politically black women's groups over the last four years striving to raise consciousness of black identity for women and equality aiming to address issues faced by the whole black community. Black feminists have highlighted how they and the issues they care about are often marginalized or excluded within white-dominated feminist groups. Also, some so-called key feminist concerns, such as free, safe contraception and abortion, look entirely different from their perspective. Black and ethnic minority women, poor women, disabled, and immigrant women have had to fight instead against state-enforced sterilization or contraception. Many feel that white, privileged, Western feminists are guilty of talking about them, but of ignoring their own activism and opinions. Transgender feminism, often called transfeminism, which brings together feminism with trans approaches and concepts, continues to gain prominence. Transfeminism, some argue, shows just how far gender roles are socially constructed rather than biologically driven. Yet within some feminist groups, especially those who advocate women-only spaces, transsexual women have to struggle to be recognized as women and as allies in their struggle against gender oppression. And the final bit I'm going to read out for you is from a section called Feminism Tomorrow, and this is going to be the end of the sample. Feminism continues to be claimed, reclaimed, expressed, and lived out today, and this will continue tomorrow. We write this new preface, sobered by the powers of patriarchy, capitalism, racism, classism, and homophobia, under which much of the world toils. Even so, attempts to create new worlds through inspiring, creative, diverse, and powerful acts of resistance give us all hope again. All right, guys, if that sounded interesting and a nice survey, uh, if you've learned some stuff, then I strongly encourage you to not wait for me to do any more videos on this book because you might be waiting a while given my schedule. But um, if you don't want to wait, go out, check out Reclaiming the F Word Feminism Today by Catherine Redfern and Kristen Oon, or Une, A-U-N-E, like I said, not sure how to pronounce it. Um, it's It's really good and obviously quite inclusive. So, I hope, again, that you found this interesting, and I will say what I usually say at this point in the video. I've been Christy, you've been awesome, thank you for your time and attention, and I'll be talking to you again really soon. Bye-bye.